Up next is Scott Roo, Site Reliability Engineer from Cisco, talking about how Helm and Terraform work together to explore patterns, helping Terraform practitioners safely engage with Helm charts and adopt its resources. Hey everybody, uh, my name is Scott Rue. I'm a Site Reliability Engineer at Cisco Meraki, and uh, today I want to talk to you about um, automating Helm provisioning with Terraform. That is to say, using Terraform to really drive the configuration process for applications that run on Kubernetes by using Helm as an IAC managed intermediary. Um, I am currently managing the back end. Um, the, I work on the scalability team um, at Meraki, and we're uh, the kind of single pane of glass for managing the various kinds of devices that we sell at this uh, little Cisco subsidiary. Um, Anyway, if you would like to reach out um, after the presentation, if you're on the Slack for Rejects, I'm at SRU, that's S-R-O-O. Um, and I'm also on Twitter, if you want to connect with there, um, that's at Scott Ruhu. Um, without further ado. So, infrastructure as code makes the bring up of infra simple and reliable. It provides usually a durable state store somewhere where your config state lives. And Helm, uh, it takes a lot of the complexity and hard work out of Kubernetes app deployment. It, it keeps the YAML nice and simple, and it stops you from needing to manage so many types of Kubernetes resources. So um, the big idea that I have for you today is why not think of infrastructure as code, Terraform, Puppet, whatever, and Helm and Kubernetes as a single tool chain um, that can be unified and, and used to really simplify app deployment and management. Um, and this talk is called Don't Read the Manual because there's really no manual for you to read about this. There's a handful of, of really scant blog posts about how to use Helm resources in, in Terraform. But um, you know, for the most part, I find them incredibly underutilized. And some of the work that I've done recently, uh, like when I was the lead DevOps engineer at a green tech company in Colorado, um, was to try playing around with, with ways of managing um, Helm uh, rather than trying to manage Kubernetes apps directly and really bring everything under the roof of Terraform. So that's what we're going to be talking about today. Um, the agenda, um, in, in just really brief, is going to be uh, we're going to define some terms. Uh, we're going to talk about Kubernetes. I'm sure you all know a lot about it here at uh, KubeCon. Um, but you know, even so, I wanted to just discuss some particularly relevant bits. We're going to talk about Helm. Um, we're going to talk about um, infrastructure as code and Terraform concepts, and we're going to look at how these um, are traditionally uh, deployed in the world. We will look at um, ways to deploy Kubernetes um, with Helm as the intermediary, as I've described. Um, and we're going to talk about some possible problems, and I'm going to show some of those in a brief demo that I think you'll find interesting. We're going to take a look at uh, introducing some uh, handmade, handcrafted artisan problems into a, uh, a running uh, cluster that I've set up with Helm um, and Terraform and actually just a few minutes ago. Um, before we get started, I want to talk about state. Um, and by state, in this case, I'm talking about config state. Um, it lives in different places for each of the components we're going to talk about. And so as we go through this presentation, one thing I want you to keep an eye on is I've made a little kind of call out that says state. Uh, whenever um, I, I want to sort of indicate to you that something we're looking at is the authoritative local state store for config in a particular context. So you'll see that, and I'll call it out. Just wanted to make sure that you were aware that's going to come up. Um, mostly because state is something where um, many of you will have some questions about this as operators. It's, uh, it, it's an area where there's potential for really great conflict. But let's start off with a conversation about what the relevant technology is. And as you can see, it's all really off-the-shelf stuff that you've probably seen or at least heard of before. There's Terraform that I'm going to talk about for IAC. Um, but Terraform is, of course, not the only IAC provider. There's also Puppet um, and Chef and a few others that do really similar work. I'm familiar with Terraform, so I'm going to be um, you know, running the conversation with it as the kind of prime mover. But um, there's very good reason to look at um, other providers for that as well, if you're interested. We're going to be talking about Helm, um, which builds itself as the package manager for Kubernetes, but I actually think that's a bit of a misnomer. We'll, we'll talk about that um, shortly here as well. And uh, Kubernetes, you know it, you love it, it orchestrates containers. Um, let's start with Kates. So Kubernetes um, is just a wish the heart makes for an arbitrary number of containers. Um, and the relevant parts that I really wanted to highlight, um, you're probably familiar with the client end, usually um, you know, if it's the CLI client, then it's gonna be something like kubectl. Um, 
you'll make changes to uh, the control plane um, through the API server component. That will reflect those changes in um, your various Kubernetes nodes. Um, and the uh, config that you uh, write to the control plane that drives those changes is the state that I'm talking about. Um, and that's stored in etcd, um, which is the persistent storage backend for Kubernetes. Um, so there's a few things that I think is really important to highlight as we talk about Helm. I just wanted to give you a brief refresher. I'm sure you all have heard of CRDs. These are um, custom resource definitions. And CRDs um, are the ability to extend the Kubernetes API. Um, so they allow us to write new kinds of things into etcd rather than just like, you know, a, a, a persistent volume plane, you know, a stateful set, something like that. Um, we will write uh, a new kind of resource uh, and that will allow us um, to create that resource using the client through the API server. Um, there's another part of um, etcd that I also really wanted to call out here, and it's secrets. Um, secrets uh, is, is a chunk of etcd that you can use to store potentially sensitive information, although um, there's quite a bit of mishigas around that. I don't want to get too much into using secrets as a store for secret things, um, but it exists in there, and that's relevant for the conversation we're going to have about Helm, so bear it in mind. Um, and, and the other thing I, I think is important to recognize about Kubernetes while we're talking about it is that, you know, a Kubernetes manifest is human readable, but only technically. And, and I think that's an important call out here. The reason why things like Helm exist is because Kubernetes config is really verbose. It's very precise. Um, and, and that's why Helm is such an important tool. And if you're not using it, I, I would take this moment to um, consider that um, as, as a possibility for yourself. So looking at Helm and turning to what it does, um, it's called the package manager for Kubernetes, but I, I think it's more apt to consider it the package management ecosystem for Kubernetes. Um, and, and the reason why I want to draw that distinction is because it's actually kind of a set of things. Um, starting with the Helm chart, which is a template, it's a YAML template, um, for which uh, a user of Helm can provide values in the form of a config file. So someone, an app developer, um, or, or maybe even yourself in this, in this very room, um, might write um, a way to deploy your application on Kubernetes. And that's a Helm chart. Um, and it allows you to give your users a relatively small number of values that you need to provide them in order for you to spin up all of the config that ends up going in etcd, all the replica sets, all the stateful sets, everything that's kind of like the, the complicated stuff um, that, that ends up actually driving um, the changes you want to make on the nodes. So um, the YAML config for a Helm chart um, is just so much simpler than Kubernetes config, which is why it's really powerful. So you sitting on your laptop client will make a change to um, uh, the control plane by invoking the Helm binary um, and pulling in a, a chart, specifying what chart you want to use, um, specifying the YAML config you want to use to make that change, and then Helm will go ahead and make all those API server calls to create new CRDs and write new config to etcd and um, you know set up things all across uh, the control plane that is then reflected in the node group. So that's the basic idea of Helm. I've, I've simplified it maybe a little bit too much, but I feel like that sort of gets across how Helm will deploy an application to your Kubernetes cluster. But Helm doesn't create Kate's clusters, and so in that way it's really distinct from something like Chef, Puppet, Terraform. It doesn't do the work of like deploying um, the infra. It deploys the application. Um, and so um, as well, I think it's important to understand uh, where the state uh, for Helm actually lives. Um, and Helm's state is something called a Helm release. A Helm release um, consists of all of those user supplied values from the YAML config. They get sort of packaged up along with um, the version uh, of them. Helm releases are versions, so you can apply a Helm release and then apply a new one, and it's automatically um, version n plus one uh, from the last one. And you can also roll them back. Um, so it's, it's stateful in another way, in that way, I guess you could say. And, and the versioning there is, is super helpful, um, especially um, if you need to make a change to Kubernetes. You don't need to then um, diff your uh, files exactly, because the, the Helm releases do a lot of that work for you. It's really flexible that way. But bear in mind, um, this secret, uh, the Helm release, it's encrypted, it's stored in secrets, and so Kubernetes doesn't read that. It doesn't apply the Helm release. Helm is what applies um, the config you stuck in the release by like expanding that stuff and generating using Jinja and, and stuff like that, all of the YAML that actually ends up being um, your config um, for, for etcd. So 
Um, it's important to understand Kubernetes is running all of the expanded YAML, but this condensed set of user inputs that, like, that constitutes your Helm release is actually a completely separate state. It's totally um, like divorced from that. And it's what the config in Kubernetes uh, is based on. But Helm does that translation work. So there's effectively two states there, and that's important to keep your eye on when you're considering the possibility of any of this going split-brained at any time. Okay, and then finally, uh, in terms of technology, I want to talk a little bit about infrastructure as code. We're going to be talking about it through the lens of Terraform because it's the one I've worked with the most, but a lot of other IAC works very similarly to this, just conceptually. So Terraform, much like Helm, is kind of an ecosystem of tools, but for the most part, when I'm talking about Terraform, what I mean is the Terraform binary, um, which will run, again, from like either from your laptop or maybe you'll have your CI run it, um, you'll run like just a container that has the binary in it, something like that. And um, it's the binary plus um, config language. And the config language is called um, HCL, HashiCorp config lang. Um, and HCL um, is what you write your input in. So you'll write, for example, um, you'll, you'll declare, as for example, an EC2 instance, if you're using AWS. And it'll have a certain set of required parameters and a bunch more optional parameters. It'll need to know what its name is. Um, it'll need to know, you know, uh, what what size it is, what type of instance for for EC2. Um, and uh, in addition, you can provide it a whole bunch of other stuff. And um, at that point, um, Terraform, the client, will parse your HCL config. You've got this file that says, "I need you to instantiate uh, an EC2," and it'll check its own state. Now, Terraform state is the most amorphous um, of, of any of the tools we're going to talk about today because it can technically live anywhere. Um, Terraform state file can be locally in the same directory the binary is at. It can be uh, in the public cloud somewhere. It can be uh, in a Kubernetes cluster inside etcd. Uh, really anything that's got the capacity to store stuff with key value storage uh, could potentially work for Terraform. I can also go inside a SQL database. There's, there's a lot of options for you as an operator running this. Um, but so um, Terraform has this idea in its state of what the world of, the real world of infrastructure looks like. So um, Terraform will, in our case, in our example of just setting up one EC2 instance, if you don't have um, that EC2 instance existing already, something with um, those exact parameters, um, then Terraform will uh, see in its state that there's no EC2 instance um, with an ID matching one that's instantiated like yours. Um, by the way, that's where our state lives. And uh, it'll go ahead and reach out to AWS to first of all refresh that state and confirm that that's actually true to the best of our knowledge up to the moment we run the apply. Um, and then it'll reach out through a, a suite uh, of API integrations called providers. Um, and these providers are what allow us to talk to AWS or OpenStack or Azure or Alibaba, whatever um, your particular preferred client is, or to just like a vanilla Kubernetes cluster. And then it will attempt to reconcile the difference between the state and the world. And so in this case, if the state has, um, that is to say, if, if we've sort of pushed a proposed change to our state that says we want one more EC2 instance with all these parameters, and the world has none of those, then Terraform will go and try to create. And these are mostly just handled through really basic CRUD integrations. And so much like Kubernetes, um, the primitives are super easy to understand. Um, it's just making API requests um, using provided credentials to make stuff happen and, and to reconcile um, three different things. And those three things are the actual status of the infrastructure, the current Terraform state file, wherever you might have put it, and the config code that you've written. And so usually that's sort of upwardly flowing there. Um, you write code to propose changes to the state file, and Terraform's job is to keep the infrastructure and the state file in sync, and to notify you when it finds changes that have occurred out of its control. So I would describe it as kind of um, a skeptical source of truth, Terraform's state file. So, I want to put this all together for you now so you can kind of get a better idea of how these concepts of state all work together. Um, so looking at this, the way that I'm proposing uh, that you uh, might want to try operating uh, applications that run on Kubernetes is basically like so. Terraform is meant to contain all of your configuration. 
So you um, will find that Terraform has a resource type called Helm, uh, Helm Release. And so looking back at this slide, this shows how Helm looks when you're just running vanilla Helm, right? Um, what Terraform does really is it takes this YAML config down here um, and sticks that inside of an HCL file as just values. And then it automates um, the creation and maintenance of Helm releases, right? Um, Helm release being the state. So you can think of Terraform's role here um, as creating and managing Helm state and using the Helm provider, which is a version of this client here, um, to reconcile that state with Kubernetes's running state. So that's the proposal. Um, and you can see that um, if we have Terraform as the source of truth for config, and we have it configuring Kubernetes and Helm, that is to say Kubernetes through Helm, then you don't ever need to touch Helm. Um, Helm is just an intermediary. You don't need to install the Helm binary. You don't need to manually download any charts with Helm. You'll need to look at the charts so that you know what values to stick in uh, Terraform. But that's about as far as it goes. And you also probably don't ever need to actually touch Kubernetes. Kubernetes obviously is managing your resources and it's storing Helm config in secrets. And you'll see the uh, reflections of that Helm config um, in various other kinds of places. However, uh, sorry, you'll see the reflections of that Helm config um, in the Kubernetes cluster. I don't know why my window just blew up there. But anyway, um, Kubernetes is not something you'll need to manually edit. Um, and it will uh, still provide you all of the logging and observability data that you might care about. But um, you won't at any point need to um, touch the config that's written to Kubernetes. And in fact, that's a major source of trouble, is touching Helm and touching Kubernetes. So let's talk about where some issues might arise here. Basically, there are two main areas where you can find uh, like trouble in, in this kind of a setup. One of them is out-of-band changes to Terraform. Right, to the state that Terraform understands, um, and to Terraform state file. Uh, and the other is uh, out-of-band changes to the infrastructure. So um, the, the first one is basically best understood as like uh, a, a possible scenario for this is maybe one of your engineers um, writes some Terraform code and then hits Terraform apply to like reconcile the world with the state they're proposing. And they're not supposed to do that. And this is a problem anywhere you've got infrastructure as code. So, um, one of the ways in which I would suggest mitigating that kind of thing uh, is by CI-ifying um, your infrastructure as code application. There's pluses and minuses to that kind of thing, and I would hate to um, present it as an unalloyed good, but if you restrict access generally to just um, an account that's managed um, and then have, having your CI run changes, um, this is good for um, you know, accounting. We, we know who's making changes because it's tracked by, um, you know, it's tracked by both the sort of job running uh, tracking that comes for free with CI like Jenkins or, uh, or GitLab. Um, and as well, um, it just prevents this kind of uh, issue where you're applying code um, without having that code reviewed. Um, so that seems fairly common sense, but um, it, it's something that many of us don't necessarily think of. And another thing that many of us don't necessarily think of like as a first practice to implement, especially in smaller, more agile orgs, um, is out-of-band changes to the infrastructure itself. So like that includes making a change by writing new YAML to Helm, um, making a change by uh, changing something directly in Kubernetes config and the manifests that are up there, um, and, and basically everything downstream of there, changes on the nodes, um, stuff like that. And the best defense I can propose against something like this is probably just the built-in security that's available to you. So we know already, because I mentioned it, Helm releases are encrypted. Um, and they're not just base64 encoded, they're, they're encrypted with a key that Helm has. And so it's actually really difficult to make a change to a Helm release out of band, um, which is super handy, um, at least that way. It's hard to tamper with that state. Similarly, um, with Kubernetes, again, I know it's not the first thing many of us think of, um, but we really should. Kubernetes RBAC is a really good idea to implement. Um, and if you're running a managed cluster in like a public cloud or something, you know, 
SSO um, and permissions and IAM, these are things we need to think about in order to prevent people from messing around uh, in a lot of this code because that's an area where you can um, locate some deviations. The thing is, and the, the main uh, reason why I bring this up is because the danger here is that Terraform can only detect out-of-band changes performed by Helm. I'm going to show you an example of this in the demo, but basically it may be hard or even impossible to revert one of those changes from Terraform. Terraform can like find out that you change the number of pods in the manifest, but it can't actually make new ones because um, it's not managing that aspect of Kubernetes directly. It's only managing Helm. So if you make a new Helm release version, um, all Terraform can do is kind of like grab that, but especially if that Helm um, release is part of a module, you might not even be able to edit the part of Terraform that's got the values, so unless you're writing that values YAML entirely yourself, um, which you can, but depending on the application, I suppose. Um, so you, you wouldn't be able uh, to, to make modifications to it. So I, I guess my, my main point here is, um, making changes only in that top level terraform source of truth is the best way to prevent yourself from getting into a situation um, where you're going to be stuck with a change that someone made um, only able to detect it so uh, let's have a look at um, some examples of this I, i'm going to run a demo here um, and here's the versions i'm using i'm going to be showing you an example of a cluster i just created um, about half an hour ago uh, that is going to be uh, based on a Terraform module I wrote um, a little while back. And so the versions of everything involved are here. I'd invite you to take a look at um, the Terraform registry so you can see how this module works a little bit more in detail later. I'm going to give you the very basics right now. So taking a look at what we have. If I do k get pods, um, you can see that we are presently now. There's a namespace for this. You can see we're presently running um, five Vault pods. The application, um, by the way, is Vault that I have installed on this Kubernetes cluster. Sorry, I didn't mention that until now. So um, I have split Vault up into five pods. Um, for HA redundancy, the, the storage for um, our, our Vault here is, is split across five units using Raft. And you can see this is live. Uh, I'm running it at vault.rubernetes.dev. That's a little pun for all you fans of my last name. Um, <laughs> And you can see that it is, um, as you can see, raft storage is initialized across all five of these uh, vault pods in the cluster. So um, we can also see um, details about this cluster in um, GKE. Uh, so you can see here's the cluster, all the details about it. You can see uh, nodes. We have a single node pool, which is part of this module um, that has five nodes. And that is also reflected, as you can see, in the Terraform config I've written for this um, GKE Helm Vault. You can see I've got five pods here. You can see um, the Vault version I've told it to run is 182, and that is reflected down here. So um, that all looks pretty much correct. Um, you'll have to take my word for it that effectively what we're doing here is um, the, uh, we created a module that creates a Kubernetes cluster, it creates some DNS records, and it creates a Helm release uh, that runs the Vault application on top of that cluster. That's all we've really got. So um, here's the cluster. It exists. It's real. And I also wanted to show you one more thing, which is that if we browse the objects in this cluster, we can see um, in the secret uh, category here, if I blow this up a little bit, there is sh.helm.release.v1.vault.v1. So you can see here we are running. Um, a Helm release, and it's version one of that Helm release, um, and it's in the vault namespace, by the way, that's not um, shown here, but if I go back, you'll see um, we're looking at the vault namespace. Um, and, and so that's all important information to note. Um, let's make a change really quick to this config in Terraform. What I'd like to do is change us from a cluster with five vault pods to one with seven vault pods. Um, each of my pods is just running the Vault application effectively and some storage backend stuff, but it, it's really pretty trivial. So um, let's run Terraform apply to make that change, and you'll see it in real time spin up two extra nodes, uh, each of which with one pod on them. 
and they're set up with different nodes for just redundancy and reliability reasons um, and you can see in this config what we're doing really is um, I'm, I'm just making uh, a couple of changes so we'll be creating uh, and this is all boilerplate the main thing is that we're changing the values in the helm release resource um, we're changing it from having one two three four five um, vault nodes all the way to uh, one two three four five six seven zero through six so I'll be making that change right now you can see for yourself and as we're making the change we can monitor it over here in the node pool Node pool. It is updating. Actually, going to pause the video here and wait for this to finish applying. And hey, just like that, just like magic, um, we have an additional two pods, and they're just getting ready to run now. Um, that should be reflected in the vault as well. Yes, in fact, we have two new pods. They're still coming online. That's not terribly important for our purposes here. Anyway, um, so you can see um, kind of the power of this entire situation. That's all been provisioned through Helm. And if we look at Helm uh, and how it conceives of this entire process, um, we can now see, by the way, um, an object browser. If we refresh this we have an additional Helm release, so we're on version 2 of Helm in this case. Um, and if we look at Helm status vault, we can see we're on revision number 2, which has been deployed. Um, we can also see um, what user supplied config we have, and this is the decrypted version of the, of the file that lives in etcd and secrets. Um, and you can see here, um, this is everything in config, uh, more or less, uh, that's been provided in terms of like all of our uh, all of our seven pods. Um, we can see a few other things that are part of the uh, of the modules configuration here, um, and so that's really um, kind of the 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 bones of the thing. Uh, and this is the running configuration as we understand it. And we can also get if we uh, choose to do so um, from Helm the entire manifest that it's going to use to push up to uh, Kubernetes in its kind of completed templated out form, and that's uh, this manifest here which is really long, and I'm not going to go through the entire thing, but that's all the CRDs um, and the actual manifest for um, the nodes that we want to use. And, and so that's, that's everything um, uh, that's kind of filled out from that original set of user supply values. Now, one interesting part of this is if we, um, if we grab these values, um, Helm get values, vault dash and vault, all the user supply values, and we stick them in uh, this YAML file I happen to have called Danger Helm. Right, I'm just gonna go to this fella, and let's say we wanted to make a really quick sneaky change um, to Vault. Let's say I want to turn off our handy dandy UI that we've been browsing to this whole time. Um, false here, yeah. Um, and I can actually do uh, I can make a Helm update entirely out of band. It's called a Helm upgrade, um, and what I'm specifying here is the danger uh, the danger Helm YAML file uh, and the namespace we're using because it uses Kubernetes namespaces and the chart um, that we want to apply that YAML based on. Uh, you can see that that will cause us to um, create a uh, a brand new revision, revision 3, which exists here in Object Browser, and now that's applied, we've lost access to Vault. UI will be entirely shut off. Let's see, we're spinning here. Let's go. Yeah, nothing. This is exactly what I'm talking about. So that change has been made, but uh, our Terraform state can only detect this. It can't do anything to help us reconcile it, as you'll see from what I'm about to do here. 
running Terraform apply. All we can see uh, is that out of band changes have been detected. Objects have changed outside Terraform. And so that's one of the dangers. That's the reason why it's important not to make changes um, to Helm directly or to Kubernetes directly, because all Terraform can do in this case is notice that something about the release has changed. Um, and making a, a fix would be potentially catastrophic. So that's kind of what I'm getting at um, when, when I'm talking about uh, making changes to Terraform only. All Terraform can do, and what it's proposing to do here, is update. Um, the node count that we have collected from there. So um, that having been said, uh, thank you very much for listening to my presentation. Um, I'd love to answer some questions. Uh, and so if you all have any that you'd like to uh, throw at me again, I would invite you to reach out to me on reject slack. I'm at SRU. Um, reach out to me on Twitter. Um, and uh, I'd be very interested to talk to any of you who are um, interested in perhaps adopting or at least considering some of the uh, pros and cons of this tool chain. Thanks so much for your time. Have a great rest of your Rejects Con. Thanks to Microsoft Azure and Equinix Metal for supporting us at the champion level. We also want to thank Red Hat and Slim.ai for funding us at our supporter level.